the 2016 Maddie collector line offered by Mattel was not as robust as originally planned. It was more or less cut in half with a lot of items that were in development dropped. But one thing did continue, and that's the Snake Mountain playset. And this is its story. So what is Snake Mountain? Well, this is Snake Mountain. It's the fortress that Skeletor lives in. Started off in the Filmation series, but eventually grew to have a life of its own and have many different forms, both toy forms and forms in the entertainment. But the story of the original playset from 1984 harkens back to the origins of the He-Man brand and how it was created. See, He-Man was originally much more of a jungle adventure, even much more of a sort of Tarzan Conan ripoff than people give it credit for, although it wasn't quite the ripoff, but that's a whole other story. The point is, the origins of He-Man are very much tied into the classic jungle adventure archetype, and it wasn't just limited to the original mini-comics. Lots of the pre-filmation content surrounded He-Man on jungle adventure, so it's no surprise that the second playset designed for the line was He-Man's adventure playset in the jungle, featuring a giant boulder, a rope bridge, and a waterfall. The playset was transformed into Snake Mountain after it was combined with a second in-development He-Man toy, which was this Monster Walker. Why would He-Man need another Monster Walker, or rather Skeletor? Well, to compete and one-up the Dragon Walker. The Dragon Walker toy won Mattel's coveted Toy of the Year internally. So when something does that, usually you what's called anniversary that item. I mean, find a way to bring it back a second year. So the giant walking purple monster was going to be the new update to the Dragon Walker, but this time for the bad guys. Hey, much like the Native American with the buffalo, Mattel wastes nothing. In fact, most toy companies don't. Everything gets reused. So what was originally a jungle adventure playset suddenly became Snake Mountain and was sold to kids everywhere in 1984, coming with everything you see here, including double snake folding out shell with the bridge and the lava and hey it actually had some pretty innovative features now when the playset was finally released for masters of the universe classics it was through super seven and it was by far the biggest he-man playset ever dwarfing the classic castle grayskull that had come a few years earlier and super seven was smart enough to do a funding meaning they weren't going to go into production and pay that ridiculously high tooling bill until they had enough customers to actually fund it you need this for this type of project and because Super 7 is very in tune with the collector, and no, I'm not pimping for them, I just respect what they do, they showed development of it all along the way, even throughout COVID, and when collectors finally were able to get their fully painted awesome model, well, it was hopefully everything that was promised. I actually didn't get one myself, but it's only because of lack of space. I just didn't know what I was going to do with this giant thing. But I was very impressed and amazed that it was able to come out because I'd spent a long time working on it. So when you're doing a playset for six and a half inch figures, it means you're dealing with a very large playset, and selling one at retail is virtually impossible these days. Even playsets for five inch figures or three inch figures is tough. So we had to create blueprints and drawings, illustrations, pretty much anything we could, and we did pre-sell it, much like what Super 7 did with their Snake Mountain. Although we really only had foam models, we didn't really have the resources to show all of the pre-production items that later pre-sell items would have. But the fans did step up, and we were able to hit that minimum order quantity in order to produce it. And months later, or rather pretty much a year later, this awesome box showed up in people's doorsteps. And there were a lot of lasting features from doing the Castle Grayskull for Masters of the Universe classics, like this orb room, which went on to be incorporated in other versions of the toy, like the Mega Bloks Castle Grayskull. Skull? Castle Gray Scat? What's a Castle Gray Scat? Anyway, speaking of mistakes, well, we learned a lot from doing Castle Grey Skull, and if we were going to do another playset sold in this way, well, there were some things we were going to do, like get the money up front. This was actually the biggest problem with the castles. We didn't ask anyone to pay for it till the end. Unlike things like HasLab, which do require an upfront fee. And fans rebelled against this. They would say things like, oh, all of these HasLab items are like giving Hasbro a interest-free loan for 16 months. But that's actually not how it works. Pick up any business or accounting textbook and you realize that something like a pre-sale is no different than a gift card. It is a liability against the company, not an asset. So you're not giving them a free loan. You are helping to fund the tooling, which is then going to produce the toy, but you're not just giving them profit to work with. It doesn't work that way. In fact, that's not legal when you're a publicly owned company. You have to understand how assets and liabilities and then relate them 
properly to the stockholders. So yeah, you don't get to keep the money until you ship these out. Now, unlike what Hasbro, or rather what Mattel was able to do, HasLab is incredibly supported by upper management, and you can tell because of all of the computer designs and modeling that they're able to do, and fans were able to really step up, and much like with Castle Grayskull, and come together to support these creations. But when it came time to actually picking up the castle, which didn't have a pre-buy, meaning you didn't have to put money up front, well, a lot of people didn't show up. And that became a big problem. I mean, yes, I know there were things shown in the early illustrations that didn't wind up in the final castle. Probably most notably was the sculpted dungeon grate, which had to be turned into a sticker due to cost reasons. But this was all new to us. It was a new experience, a new experiment. But because so many people never showed up to buy the castle that they pre-ordered because there was no monetary commitment at the time, well, it left a lot in the warehouse and it meant that we were basically going to have to dig new ground if we were going to try to do another playset. And we were going to have to learn from lessons and this time have a successful pre-sale, which meant doing everything made to order and taking all the money up front, much like what HasLab does. It avoids that problem and, well, having the discount sell unclaimed Castle Grayskulls did not help. So, Snake Mountain, with those new perimeters, was now on the table and Mattel was behind it. B-sheets were created, features were thought through, inclusions, what items would be in it. And one thing that the lead designer, Ruben Martinez, really wanted to do was take advantage of the old sound amplifier. This was a feature that didn't really show up too much outside of Mattel's catalog. And I don't even know how many kids remember playing fondly with this. I have very few memories, even though uh, my best friend Sean had Snake Mountain. Regardless... Ruben's passionate plan was to incorporate Bluetooth technology into the new Snake Mountain. Now, for those of you not familiar with Bluetooth, it lets you remotely operate different machines. Most commonly, we see this on things like remote control trash cans, but surprisingly, it's also really popular on speakers. So the idea was, hey, if we're going to have a Bluetooth connection to the Snake Mountain playset, we could just basically make it a speaker that you could both talk through using your phone or just play music. So. It seemed like a great idea, but I was really scared about how much this was going to drive up the cost because we were already looking at something that was going to be at least $350, $400. Another thing that we were looking at was including that little sparkly portal that Skeletor is always using. I guess it would have kind of looked like this maybe as an action figure item, but it was definitely one of the items that never made it into the Super 7 version that was in the original Mattel version. But the torch had to be passed, and with the Masters of the Universe classic line going, at least temporarily, to Super 7, so did Snake Mountain. So despite several years of work on the project, it never got produced by Mattel, but I'm darn glad that Snake Mountain was made, because even if you couldn't have the sparkly, sparkly portal that Skeletor loved to use in filmation, you still got the castle. And I really do think that what Super 7 does with things like Ultimates is where adult toy collectibles should be because the company doesn't have huge overhead and can focus on the needs of a more discriminating collector. So hey, for those of you who got it from Super 7, awesome. It was a great toy to work on and I hope you enjoyed this video at a look of the development of Snake Mountain Masters of the Universe Classics at Mattel before it got passed along. Thanks for watching, thanks for sharing, and I'll see you guys in the next video.